Thank you very much for that. I'm going to keep my introduction very quick, not simply because I'm about to introduce two very well-known people who have brought us the future, but for another reason that I'll get into at the end of my introduction. Now, this morning, what we looked at really was a picture of a world of enterprise computing in which the cloud is not simply a distant data center. The cloud is an awareness of mobility. It's a computational world in which there is mobile, there are APIs creating and disassembling and building new uh, software systems at all times. There's AI mediating, and of course, in the cloud itself, in those data centers, there are enormous databases and AI systems and machine learning systems that are in almost a continual two-way uh, interaction with mobility, with endpoint devices, with sensors, and these are just the early days of what amounts to a kind of computational intelligence distributed at every point in the planet. So I mentioned this to Vince Cerf the other day. I sort of said, this is a picture of the world we are occupying and it will increase in proficiency. And he said, oh, well, that's, you know, that's ubiquitous computing. And Mark Weiser was talking about that in the 70s. And Vint knows that because, of course, he architected the internet. He did TCP IP. And since 2005, he's been the chief evangelist at Google, where he is involved in spotting the best internet technologies and fostering the idea that those products and those services can be best built in the largest possible systems. Mark Andreessen, of course, developed the Mosaic web browser. He co-founded um, Netscape. He started a web hosting company called Loud Cloud uh, back in the day where companies could just plug into computing like it was a utility. And now, of course, at Andreessen Horowitz, he uh, invests exactly in this world of computational intelligence everywhere. Now, until recently, of course, Mark was off Twitter having had a minor career as the ultimate tweet stormer. He came back recently onto Twitter, um, leveraging a site called 21.co, where he answers questions for $100 a pop. And the um, proceeds of that go to the organization Black Girls Code. Well, we love this idea, so we decided at the session today, every time Mark answers a question, we're going to contribute 100 bucks to Black Girls Code. And of course, in the interest of fairness, Vince answers, get a hundred bucks too. So, without a further ado, Mark Andreessen and Vince Cerf. All right. All right. So, let's start. Uh, the cloud, that's going to be a big deal, yes or no? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry? What? That's two. That's two. Keep count. That's two. That's two. That's two. That's two. That's two. But I want $200 for that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, develop it in the next one. So we talked about this idea of computational intelligence everywhere and this enormous mediating influence. Um, what do you think will be the most important as yet sort of barely discerned or unrealized dimensions of this, particularly where enterprise is concerned? So, you know, my first thought is that we're moving from a space where the cloud is kind of homogeneous and uniform to a space where it can be and is becoming less uniform, it's becoming differentiated. And so the cloud's providers may be able to offer a variety of different kinds of services. At Google, for example, we're seriously looking at quantum computing, we're seriously looking at neural networks. Uh, we're trying to make those various capabilities accessible through publicly known APIs. The whole idea here is to give a variety of, of functional computational capabilities in the cloud systems. But there's a second possibility that I'm curious about, and that's the recognition that there are multiple clouds out there, and there is the conceivable utility in being able to move data back and forth among the clouds, even imagining doing computations partly in one cloud and partly in another and exchanging information back and forth. How many big clouds do you think there'll be? It's hard to say. Uh, the one thing that can happen is that uh, companies will want to run little cloudlets of their own. They'll want to be able to interact with right. uh, the major clouds, for example, keeping some data uh, on their end. The protocols for doing this, however, are not quite uh, there. It's kind of like the days of the internet. Before the internet, we had networks from IBM and Digital uh, and Hewlett Packard. You could connect their brands of computers together over the networks, but you couldn't link them cross brands. And so the internet said, wait a minute, let's see if we can find a way to do that. So that's where I think intercloud may eventually emerge. But mm -hmm. Mark, you may have a, a different view. So 
Uh, let me come at it from a different standpoint. So I think you're talking about the idea basically of intelligence permeating everything and then being connected up to the cloud. So I, th I think this is something, and I'll just come at it from a different, or maybe a, a sort of a more elliptical angle. Um, I think this is something environmentalists should be very fired up about that I'm kind of surprised they're not, which is leverage on the real world, right? If, if, if le leverage on physical resources. And so let me give you just kind of the obvious example people are playing with right now. Um, the average car uh, in the United States uh, is utilized 4% of the time, right? So 96% of the time it sits parked. By the way, there are a billion parking spots in the US, and if you aggregate up those billion parking spots, you have the state of Connecticut, like literally in terms of size. Um, and so this is just massive waste and inefficiency because the, the, cars, the cars aren't connected, the cars, the cars aren't, aren't, aren't in the cloud. And so 96% of the time they sit there, and then by definition, 96% of the sheet metal and the glass and everything else that, that, that goes into the car um, that's produced uh, is just sitting idle. And so take, take on the other hand, the, the new world emerging of self-driving cars connected to the cloud and then run as a cloud-mediated network uh, with rides on demand. Um, and you probably can't get car utilization up to 100%. But you could probably get it up to 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. Step functions of Step efficiency. Function, 10x increase in efficiency, and then yeah. therefore a corresponding decrease in the number of automobiles, therefore a, a, a de decreasing physical impact and in the creation, on production. In the creation of that efficiency in itself, there are opportunities. Yeah. Other things are freed up. Yeah, everything is freed up from an economic. As someone who grew up in Connecticut, equating it to a large disused parking lot is interesting. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, it actually means, it actually, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you speculate on that. I, I, um, it, it does mean, for example, it also means you can transform cities, right? You can turn cities into parks because you can take out a lot of the streets and a lot of the parking spots, parking lots. But just the physical impact, the resource load on the environment, right? Um, and so there, there are going to be all kinds of areas where as the world gets smarter and we can capture more data in software, bring it up in the cloud, and then sort of lever the physical world through software, um, there's huge efficiency gains that people aren't even thinking about today that I think also will go straight to a lot of the current environmental issues. Yeah, and I want to dig a little bit. Sorry, go ahead. This sounds a lot like trying to model what's going on then more accurately. You know, in Singapore, uh, they are building a model of the city. It's a city state. There are about, what, five million people who live there. But they're building a very accurate model to try to understand how the resources of the city are used by the people who live there. Uh, I don't know, you guys remember The Matrix? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and, and no, I don't think I was the model for the architect, but anyway. <laughs> You've been programmed to think that. But, but the important thing is, that in the story, they were emulating the population of people in order to feed them ads to see how they would react. But what the Singaporean uh, researchers are doing is trying to do a very, very uh, fine-grained model of the way in which transportation and other resources in the city are being used in order to understand if they change things, if they could modify it, it would make a difference. So this modeling thing and ability to calculate based on data you receive is a really powerful idea. So they're going to model for an unintended consequence? Uh, After a fashion. Well, that's possible. Too. Yeah, that's great. Yes. Um, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into what you were saying about different types of computing in a cloud. Maybe CPUs and GPUs, that exists now, neural nets, um, and quantum eventually. And Google's doing research. This is something that you entirely foresee at this point. What are the use cases? What sort of world does that build? Well, think about the kinds of problems that these various computing engines are capable of solving. I mean, the, the neural networks are not the sort of thing you do for payroll, for example, but yet it's a very powerful tool for machine learning uh, for typical uh, AI kinds of applications. Uh, in the case of quantum computing, there are certain algorithms that will allow you to complete a computation much, much faster than you would with conventional methods. On the other hand, some problems running on a quantum computer take longer or at least no better than a conventional machine. The whole idea here is to get the problem to fit uh, the computational capability. And now we have this broader range of opportunities to match the computing capability with the problem that we're faced with. And mm -hmm. that, I think, is, is unexplored territory at this point. It's really going to change the educational system on how coding is taught, too, isn't it? Well, I don't know whether it will change the educational system itself, but it might certainly force the educational system to help people learn how to compute using these right. different kinds of tools. Think about use cases a lot. Yeah. And um, you could even end up in a sort of regulated computing environment because quantum could be used to damage a cryptocurrency near and dear to your heart in as much as you can perhaps hit the encryption of Bitcoin using a quantum well, form. Okay, but you, you know, Mark would probably agree, and, you know, whether this is ping pong, right? Yeah. The, at this Jump stage in. of the game, it's well known that certain kinds of crypto are going to be uh, made uh, less secure because of certain quantum algorithms, Shor's algorithm, for example, that gets in the way of uh, doing logarithmic algorithms. So the solution to that is different mathematics. 
And there's already people are exploring the whole new range of mathematics that will not break against, at least Shor's algorithm wouldn't break it. I don't know, maybe you're looking into that. No, look, when you tell a venture capitalist there's a giant technical problem, we just get all excited. Right. <laughs> find me a smart guy. Find, find me a smart guy to go solve it, and we'll find right, it. So, right, right. There, there, be, there, be there is new math underway now, and there will be new ways to do that. Okay. But, 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 but look, it might be a major change. Like, it might, this might be a significant. And by the way, it might be the world needs a step function increase in security. Yeah, that would be a good thing yeah. right now. For example, this, this week, perhaps. Depends on how you feel about your democracy. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Now, um, you were saying to me earlier that you were seeing a lot more, I hate saying conventional, but historic businesses, non-Valley businesses moving in and taking a really active role in learning about the cloud directly, CEO straight to the problem, learning about ML. How do they approach it differently? What do they want from this? Yeah, so I think, so there's the history of it. So a lot of big companies got excited in the 1990s because the internet had arrived and IBM had e-business and the whole thing. And then a lot of big companies in 2000, 2001, 2002 breathed a massive sigh of relief and said, oh, thank God that internet thing didn't work. Um, and, you know, stick a fork in it, it's done. Everybody knows the dot-com thing was a bubble. That was a joke. It's over. Um, and so now we don't have to worry about it. Um, they maintained that view until I would say about 2010, 2011, um, and then I think it flipped pretty much directly into panic. Um, and, uh, and actually, interestingly, it also coincides with the generational change of leadership at a lot of the big companies, where now they, have, they, they now have a, a younger generation of leaders actually running the companies who grew up with computers, mm -hmm. uh, unlike, unlike the previous generation. And so in the last six years, we've seen a significant, a significant move and more recently a flood of big companies from incumbent industries uh, coming to Silicon Valley and trying to learn what all this stuff means and trying to figure out how to use it to either improve their business or defend against new attackers. Are they looking at, sorry, go ahead. Well, correspondingly, we've also seen the rise of, of entire new generations of startups that are now using these new technologies to directly go after incumbent industries that historically had never been threatened by technology. And you, been you mean threatened the way by technology startups. an Airbnb essentially models a hotel chain yep. or an Uber models a taxi fleet? Yeah, so the basic, the basic, the basic cal calculus here is that the tech industry historically has been very good at having a big impact on industries in which there's rapid technology change, rapid productivity change, that also turn out to be industries that, number one, just aren't that big relative to the size of the economy, and number two, aren't that regulated. And so media and entertainment, consumer electronics, retail, they're just not that big as a percentage of the economy, right? The, 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 the economy, most of the economy is healthcare, education, construction, government, right? These giant industries, right, that are just big and gigantically re regulated and with, with, with huge incumbent strength. Um, and it, it appears, or at least what a lot of entrepreneurs in the Valley believe, is that the new technologies are now so powerful and so potent, right? If you bring mobile plus, right, network access plus AI plus, you know, whatever, and you apply it into an industry like real estate or transportation or education or healthcare that you can now actually have a big impact uh, that wasn't possible in the past. And so that we're, seeing that we're seeing the attackers also show up at the same time. So I'm actually going to argue that big is not necessarily the only reason that cloud is of interest. And the other reason is that continuous computation, continuous gathering of data, continuous observation and analysis can make a huge difference. I mean, in the, in the medical world, for example, you only go to see the doctor when you're sick. So the doctor's model of you is you're always sick and he never sees you when you're healthy. If you're monitoring your body, for example, then you can get a baseline that says this is what's normal. Now they have the ability to say, uh-oh, something is not normal. But it only works because you have this continuous monitoring going on. That's probably also true for various kinds of business where you're trying to understand what's going on dynamically. And being able to see things in real time makes a huge difference. I, I won't, I, we don't have time for it, but in some of our advertising mechanisms, we know in real time how much people are spending on a particular ad. We can stop showing an ad when it runs out of the, you know, the limit that the users have set, but that only works if you have real-time computation of billing. Mm -hmm. So I think it, just to circle back, it's interesting to look at this process of these new companies modeling an industry and then attacking it, because when they do this, they don't look at it to talk about how different types of computing are, they don't look at the tool set in a siloed way. If you look at an Uber or an Airbnb or a Snap, there's mobility, there's AI, there's all these things, and they're not thinking about them in a siloed way. They're thinking about them in a very continuous way with the objective of using the best capability towards their end. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah, and, and, and then they're not trying to defend, right? So they're not trying to defend legacy investments, status quo uh, business models. They're not trying to defend, you know, big employee bases that maybe you know need to fu need to fundamentally transform. And so there's just it's it's they, say the the odds are lower. Like it's it's asymmetric. The, the 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 attacker the odds of success of the attacker are lower, right? Yeah. The odds of the, the of the defender defending successfully, but the but the the, the challenge is easier. Attacking is easier. Yeah, and even from a, from a risk point of view, if you learn something, you've got an asset at the end of it anyway. Yeah. Right. So you mentioned business models, and this raises an interesting problem. Some companies build their businesses around a model which has been very successful, newspapers are an example, and then the world moves out from under them. And so one interesting question is whether we can use these computational models to sort of help you, A, figure out whether, whether your business model is failing, or B, what alternative business models could there be? So the idea of being able to do kind of what if simulations of a fairly large-scale model of what's going on could be a very powerful tool. And only a cloud computing environment has the capacity to do that. I'll give you an, an example. So my, my friend Sam Lesson has this theory, basically says, historically in the economy, it felt like bits have always moved faster than atoms, but in reality, for most of the economy, atoms move faster than bits, right? So why do chain fast food restaurants exist? It's because if you're a hungry traveler at 9 o'clock at night and you see a McDonald's sign, you know what's there. And if you just see random Joe's Diner, you don't know if it's any good or not. And so therefore, this massive rise of chains right, across the economy and this massive decline of, of independent restaurants and bars and everything else. Uh, uh, and so what he says basically is that, that was just because the atoms, it was actually easier to get the atoms in place in the form of the McDonald's sign than it was to, 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 to transmit the information about which local restaurants are good. In the new world, right, it flips. It's now easier to go on Yelp or TripAdvisor or any of these sites or Airbnb and be able to discover, no, I actually want to stay in this apartment. I want to go to this local restaurant. I want to go to this local bar, this local coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, to have a, I'm going to have actually a better experience. It's changing the consumer, too, because they yep. can sharpen their desires better. Yep. It's not just the generic McDonald's. It's an interesting experience they can derive. That's right. And then, and then you get the feedback loop. You get the, you get the data. You collect the data. And so you get the data back. of like, you can, And you get the two-way ratings, right, like on, on Uber and Airbnb and eBay. And you get the two-way ratings. And so you actually have if anything, better quality control than the centralized management. This raises a very interesting question about the accuracy and quality of the data. Right. Uh, and in some cases, the integrity of the data. That somebody who wants to mess up your business could conceivably go in and monkey with the data, giving you the wrong impression of how your business is running. Yeah. So I think that there are gotchas that hide in this infrastructure yeah. that we're going to have to work hard to uh, protect. Who knew in the new world it's still going to be hard to be good, right? Yep. The humans. Um, to speak to the data problem and the, the large incumbent problem, the big incumbents come and obviously they have enormous amount of data they want to use and they want to generate new data and understand their customers better. What is the decisive thing for a company? Is it going to be the amount of data, the quality of data, the reliability of data, or is it case by case? My first reaction is that uh, all three have a role to play here. I, I would not want to elevate one after the other. Although the quality of the data and its reliability is terribly important because otherwise it's garbage in, garbage out. Uh, but I mentioned earlier this notion of being able to capture things on a continuous basis. That turns out to be uh, almost as important as all the other parameters that you mentioned because the continuity gives you a uh, sense for what's going on in a way that you wouldn't normally get if you have a rather slow uh, collection of uh, information. So I would say speed. Um, I, I think it's going to be speed of adaptation. Um, because they're, 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 you just look at the ways you deal with data today, they're just completely different than they were five years ago. Say more. Uh, so I mean, just the ability, for example, to apply deep learning to data is a brand new thing. Um, and you know, as, as, sort of as you indicated, like the young companies that are growing up with this technology are just doing it by default. You know, the older companies that have built up data sets and methods of processing data over 30 or 40 years aren't moving that fast on it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the, the, the algorithmic improvements and the, the ability to leverage the cloud and all the things that are happening and just the huge new flood of data that's arriving, I think it's going to be a question of flexibility to be how fast can, you, can your technical workforce actually adapt um, so, and actually do, do things so in a better now, way. Now we need to arm wrestle a little yeah. bit because sure. uh, look, think about rapid trading on the stock market. You know, one of the problems with a lot of those algorithms is they all kind of follow the same thing like kids playing soccer, right? The ball goes over here. If the market's going down, they all sell. If the market's going up, they all buy. And the market goes like that. You have a bang, bang control algorithm. So you have to be careful about fast leading to instability. So my question to you, Mark, is how do you balance the stability question against the speed of response? We assume that you're taking care of it. <laughs> Well, that's okay. Okay. 
So it is interesting. Most, Done. Right. I mean, most of our companies are so small when they start that they don't have much of, much of an impact at all. And so the, okay. the goal is to get into a position where they actually have an impact. Is this a good problem to have, you're saying? Yes. Yeah, it, it's, a high, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a high quality problem to have once you get in a position well, where you start to introduce that level of instability. So I mean, for, can... for the most part, our, 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 our company's self-identity is they're up against the man. And the man, if, if it's screwed up, it's because the man has already screwed it up. <laughs> Um, so, no, whether, whether, they're, whether, they're, uh, whether they're right or fooling themselves, I'll leave Well, then we can hope judge. that everybody who comes and uses the Google Cloud service will have that problem because they'll be big enough to do that. That would be good for everyone. It would be good. Okay. Yeah, this is enough. very much an if question um, because I know you love your job and I know you see 100 companies. But if each of you were to start a company now in this world, mm -hmm. what would you go after? What would be an interesting thing to build or do? Oh. I know what I would do. I've, I've fallen in love with a book on microbiology uh, by uh, Bruce Alberts and his colleagues. It's in the sixth edition. It's 1,766 pages of beautiful illustrations and explanation about what goes on inside a cell. It's, it's Manhattan in there. It's not a bag full of water with chemicals rolling around. So if I were to start all over again, I would want to dive into understanding what's going on in there and then extract the knowledge which we are gaining over time in order to do useful things. Like the, our, our Calico company has is, is noticed that people get old and they're trying to stop that. Of course, the engineers have a solution. You know, that's not the solution that we were after. <laughs> the, you know, They'll feel different age, in five years. We care yeah. a lot about that. So understanding what's going on will yield a lot of insights, potential therapies, and other things. So I'd be fascinated. And besides, the whole thing is so interesting. It's unbelievably complicated. Yeah. There's even a store and forward packet switching system inside there moving proteins around that have little labels on them that say where they're supposed to go. Really? And other little proteins that crawl along the microtubules that get grown, and you know, there's Pac-Man on this side, and they carry the labeled proteins to the place where they're supposed to go. The problem is, Mother Nature figured out packet switching three, three and a half billion years ago. It, it just you takes have a while to catch up. You can do this thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you? Yeah, so I think there's something happening, it's, it's similar, uh, building on what Vince said, I think there's something happening in science that's sort of the one layer below what we've been talking about. So we've been talking about the impact of computing and cloud on, on, on technology um, uh, and business. There's a layer below what's happening in science, which is, uh, this is what we see every day now, which is we see world-class biologists coming out of great research universities who are also top-end computer scientists. Um, and 10 years ago, that wasn't the case, and all of a sudden it is, and it's a generational change. We're seeing top-end physicists who are software experts. We're seeing, interestingly, top-end economists uh, who now have a totally different way of studying the economy because they, they all use software and big data in a totally different way uh, than their predecessors did. And so I, I think it's the thing, I think, I think computer science and software and information theory is colonizing the rest of science, right, the same way tech is colonizing the, the, the rest of business. Um, I think bio biology is absolutely front and center, and that would be a very interesting area to go into. And then I think economics is going to be super interesting, um, of which cryptocurrency is one example, but there will be many uh, intersection points. Um, and, um, and then I think there's you know, probably another half dozen after that that are equally interesting. So, so, I, so I'd be trying to bring computer science into other fields and then build things that haven't, there's been no way to even conceive. But we have a company we just funded as an example using deep learning to do uh, uh, cancer biopsies via blood draws. Right, um, and like if you just think, if you talk about the, the long-term implications, not only for diagnosis of cancer, but also it turns out for treatment of cancer to actually have a complete map uh, of tumors in the body with complete analysis from a, from a blood draw, just light years ahead in terms of the outcomes that you could generate. And, it, and to us, it's, it's, a, it's a software company, it's a deep learning and data company. Thank you, Cloud. Yeah. So there's a, couple, there's a couple of problems here uh, that, that we should probably recognize. Just knowing genetic sequences is no longer enough, right? You know, we have to know uh, all about the epi Epigenetics, we have to know about the microbiome in our gut because that's how our, uh, our systems have evolved together. It's our immune systems are not just human, they're also microbiome as well. So that's one issue. Um, anyway, there's, there's still a lot to be done in that space. Okay. Um, I want to say, by the way, we just passed the $2,000 mark. Oh. And um, the um, We've been keeping track. We're going to go to the lightning round in just a second with a bunch of questions that we got off Twitter before we uh, had this session. Very quickly, though, I want to take a quick break. And Vint, why don't you tell them about the invention no one knows oh, you two created? Okay, this is this is where I, I get to blame him for everything. So back in the day, around 1994, he's uh, off with uh, Jim Clark doing Netscape Communications, and I'm at MCI. 
and we decided we're going to build the MCI Mall, not Mail. I did that back in 83. This was the Mall in 1994. This was Amazon pre-Amazon. Pre-Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, 94. Yeah. Yeah, pre so, so we decided where's the highest point of departure for this, and it's obviously the Netscape communications server and client. So we bought $7 million worth of licenses for servers, and yeah, well, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you're you. on your way. So, <laughs> so then I realized that uh, you know, there are going to be transactions on the servers, and there are going to be broken transactions transactions because people will just disconnect or get halfway through and decide not to do anything. And I'm sitting here thinking my servers are going to be full of all this cruft, you know, broken transactions. And I don't want all that crap because I don't know when to get rid of it. So I go over to Mark and I say, listen, Mark, I don't want all this crap. Why don't you find a way to store it on the client side and let me get it, get the state of the transaction when I need it, when they show up and say, I'd like to finish the, the and so he goes and invents cookies. So if you don't like cookies, it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Put two great minds together and you get cookies. Strategically though, we gave them a really fun name so that, so that nobody would ever get upset. Um, <laughs> so you may not know the other, so the other side of the story. So, so oh, back, you, oh I, yeah, well, you want to tell the other side? Well, I'll, I'll tell, I'll t well, I'm right, not going to tell ahead. the side you want me to tell. I'm going to tell another side that you All don't right. know. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> So we so we get we get literally the seven million dollar check. By the way, the MCI, our second customer, um, uh, the first customer was a little bit more creative application. I'll let you leave that to your imagination. The, the MCI was the, the, the first uh, mainstream business customer. Um, uh, we get the seven million dollar check. Very big day for a startup company to get a seven seven million dollar check. So we, so we get hard at work. We're working around the clock. We're writing code. Six months or whatever goes by, and we finally get all the code done. And I'm like, okay, thank God it's done. It's all test is ready to go. Okay, set, you know, send it out, you know, get it over to him, and, and that's great. And I get to work the next day, and we get the angriest phone call I think I've ever received um, because the deployment engineer, uh, we actually did, have, did not have a process for shipping software. Um, and so the deployment, soft, the deployment engineer uh, burned uh, the software onto a CD-ROM um, and put the CD-ROM in a Ziploc baggie. <laughs> And, sh and, and shipped it, yeah. and shipped it, and shipped it to MCI. And literally, it was we paid seven million dollars, and you sent us a CD-ROM in a baggie. Yeah. <laughs> it was a new baggie. It was, it it was, it was not. It was not his sandwich bag. The good news is it was freshly. It was freshly fetched from the kitchen. At least it wasn't in a bag of Wheaties like that other AOL guy was doing. <laughs> right. right. Exactly. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So yes. I want to move to the challenge round off of Twitter. So first off, if software is eating the world and software will live in the cloud, what sorts of forms of software regulation do you think will take place? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Software regulation in the oh, cloud. Oh, oh, okay. So, you know, this is, I'm very, this is not a popular opinion to express. I did it when I was the president of the Association for Computing Machinery. For all you guys out there that are writing software, it probably all has bugs. At some point, you're not going to get away with it anymore. You're going to have to take responsibility for your bugs. Uh, you know, we, we, we need better tools to avoid making mistakes that turn into exploitable bugs. But I think that's going to be the biggest uh, challenge uh, lying ahead. That software is surrounding everything now. It's in everything. And the mistakes will become more and more visible and potentially more harmful. And so I think that there will be pressure for some sort of regulatory oversight. Maybe you'll have to get a license in order to do major projects like a civil engineer has to do. I don't know how that's all going to evolve, but I don't think that we can get away with it anymore. I used to make a living writing software, so I'm very empathetic about this, but it's a serious issue now. Okay. Mark, um, will cloud and its suppliers become totally commoditized, or is there some value in the cloud chain down the road? Yeah, so there, there, is a, there is a theory at foot, and there are people on Wall Street who certainly believe that cloud, by definition, has to be a commodity because it's a bunch of servers in Iraq and like anybody, anybody can do it. Um, my experience was that uh, for, I think, from 2000, when AWS launched in, what, 05, from 06 to, I think, 13 or maybe 14, 2014, every industry expert I spoke to uh, who was associated with any kind of systems vendor, box vendor, they swore up, down, and sideways emphatically, angrily, um, that it would be impossible for the cloud vendors to ever make any money. Like just flat impossible, because literally they're just putting boxes in a, in a, in a rack, and, and, and what can that be worth? And, sp and specifically AWS, there's no way. Like AWS has to be bleeding cash. And then Amazon was either forced or chose to finally break out AWS, and it turns out, of course, AWS is Amazon's most profitable by business. By far the best margins. And, but probably, and every time you buy a book on Amazon, it's being actually cross-subsidized by AWS, right? Not, not the other way around. Um, and so that, that caused a, I would say, rapid reevaluation inside these companies, most of which, most of whom are not, it's now too late to, uh, to, to react to what's happening. 
So I, I think existence proof is that Amazon is plenty profitable on AWS. Um, and, and then I, I just think, and I, you know, this whole conference is an example of this, I, just, I think cloud is just getting started. I think the layers of functionality that are gonna come in on top, it's all the stuff we've been talking about, but AI and all these things, it, the, the, these things are just going to get more and more useful, um, mm -hmm. and as they get more and more useful, they're going to they're going to be able to command higher and higher prices for for real value received and, and, and fantastic margins. I think they'll, they'll they'll end up being very high margin businesses and with very happy customers. Okay, so Mark has just used a term which I'd like to uh, underscore: the layers in the architecture, because what we're really involved with now is the sciences of the artificial. We're creating an artificial world that we can manipulate and change and experiment with. And that's just going to continue. So that means more opportunities for new businesses. OK. Um, uh, two sort of edge core questions. Utility at core and power at the edge. How does that dynamic play out, you think? And likewise, well, we talked about death of cloud. You don't see that coming at all. But are we moving towards an increasingly powerful edge? Or does the core become a stronger and stronger repository? Do they kind of chase each other the way they always the, have? The pendulum swings back and forth. We've seen it happen many times. Right now, we're sort of in the same place where we were in the 1960s. People would show pictures of giant buildings called, you know, the, the, the computing foundry, you know, with smoke coming out the top. Uh, and then everybody went to the private machines and, uh, you know, uh, departmental machines and things like that. And so it keeps swinging back and forth. When you start thinking about the very low power things that we use for mobiles and other uh, related IoT devices, those may end up uh, in the computing environment of the, um, of the uh, computing centers as well, for, simply because they are so uh, not power hungry. So I think that the, the two, uh, I don't think the clouds are gonna go away at all. I think what will happen is the edge is gonna keep getting more and more proliferated, but the clouds is gonna, are gonna have to be there in order to make things more coherent. Okay. What kind of structures do you think could become fundamental technologies like DNS did? Yeah, I'm sorry. Say what kind of fundamental structures do you think might become important in the future? Well, probably the most fundamental one has to do with the semantic modeling of what's going on. The, the, the thing which makes AI powerful is, is uh, its ability to build models that are analytic. Right now, we don't do that very well. I mean, we, we have uh, neural networks whose function we don't understand. And so if there were a powerful addition to the uh, computing environment that we could point at, it would be the ability to extract a model of the real world, for example, or a model of an artificial world like a company, and then try to understand how to reason about it. We don't have a vocabulary for that yet, let alone a grammar. So I, if there's a breakthrough somewhere, that's the one that I th would find the most interesting. Okay, last question for the both of you. Biggest regrets and proudest moments in your <coughs> career? Uh, I'm sorry. The biggest regrets and proudest oh, moments big, in your wow. career? Oh, wow. Well, I guess the, I, I wish that I had used IPv6 instead of IPv4 to begin with. Because <laughs> it, I meant to bring that up. You know, who knew? <laughs> And, and we probably could have done a better job of using public key crypto, except that the timing wasn't very good. The paper that was published in 76 didn't include an algorithm. Then RSA comes along a little bit later, just as we freeze the internet design. And I want to get it implemented so we can figure out if it'll work. And so I put off the public key stuff for a while. If it had been at the right time, we would have included it, except for one thing. The internet was built by graduate students, and you were all one of those once upon a time. They're the most undisciplined people in the world, and getting them to, to use crypto properly would have been impossible anyway. So it's too bad, but that's an alternate history, I think. No regrets. Uh, I'm, <laughs> no You're regrets. shocked, right? I'm from the Luke Cage School, always forward, never backwards. Um, Proudest accomplishment, I gotta say, the, the, the people I've been able to work with, and it's a, certainly, certainly Vint is one of these, um, but just the, the people I've been able to work with, and especially now, you know, younger people coming up in the industry and the ability for people to be able to realize their dreams and create new things um, and be able to learn. I, I mean, I think we're all in the process of learning and growing all the time, and I think our ability to help each other and teach each other is, in the end, is, is, is the most important thing and the most rewarding. That's a really great note to end, and I had some more questions, but we've run out of time. This was fascinating, high value, and we ended up over $3,000. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, right. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.